All right. Um, we're going to get started. Welcome to our cocktails with the curator and a guest, Ryan Hark, tonight. Thanks for being with us. I'm Jill Miranda Baker. As many of you know, I do see some new faces out there. Um, so thanks for joining us. We hope this will be an hour that is a lot of fun as well as enlightening. Um, this is our part of our curator connections programs that we offer. We also have the community views presentation um, every other month in line with cocktails with the curator on the first Wednesday at six. And for those of you who are members, you have been receiving our Florida Keys stories once a month um, on the third Wednesday where Brad takes an opportunity to kind of do a deep dive into some exclusive content and provide it to our members that isn't readily available whether in the museum or um, through a lecture. So that's been kind of fun to see the readership on that. And if you're not a member, in addition to having all the programs for free, the lectures and the curator, can, um, the community views, the uh, Florida Keys story is another special treat that only members benefit from. That being said, I will bid you farewell, at least from the uh, screen, and let Brad and Ryan take over. Enjoy. Thank you, Jill. Well, welcome, everybody. We're very pleased to have Ryan Hark uh, join us again. He's been with us on several occasions. Uh, giving lectures about some, some, some of his uh, archaeological work down at Stock Island. Um, so if you have questions about archaeology, uh, the uh, Aboriginal people of the Florida Keys, this is the right place to be because Ryan is going to provide some great answers for you. Um, Ryan, why don't you start off real quick with just kind of giving an overview of what you're doing down on Stock Island. Sure, thanks Brad, and thank you to the Florida Keys History and Discovery Center for having me back <clears throat> again tonight, albeit in a little bit different format. So I'm, I'm really excited to be here and talk about what I love most. So for about the past five years now, I've been working at, well actually maybe a little more than five, but at any, at any rate, um, I've been working at a site down near Key West called the Stock Island site, and there's many questions <clears throat> for for the research but one of the primary ones that i'm interested in is whether prehistoric times or during prehistoric times prior to the arrival of europeans in the new world were the large village sites in the keys occupied year round were they permanent settlements where people were living full-time sedentary sort of lifestyles or were these places and these sites in the Keys, again, prior to the arrival of Europeans, were they fishing camps that were used intermittently or, or during one time of the year? And then of course, wrapped up into that are all these questions of cultural or tribal identity or affinity. Were these people Calusa, Tecesta, Matacumbe, and so on. And then also just simple questions like how big were the sites and for when, what time uh, chronologically, when was the site, when were sites settled? When were they abandoned? And, and different questions like that. So although my focus was on a site near Key West, it's related to and is a part of sites across the Keys and really sites across South Florida. They're all very much intertwined. All right. Um, I'm ha I don't see a lot of faces, so if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and just go ahead and ask. Otherwise, or, or you can raise, there's not a lot of video that's up on the screen right now. Um, but if you, if, you raise your, if, you, if you raise your hand, we can call on you. Otherwise, uh, or just unmute yourself and we can wade through the questions. So if anybody has a question, please feel free to uh, engage us at, at any time. I know I, we, uh, we had a, a meeting earlier, Ryan and I did, and we're gonna bring, and we'll, and we'll be bringing some more uh, local artifacts, Aboriginal artifacts into the museum in the coming months and months. We're not, haven't hit deadlines yet, but we're excited <laughs> to, uh, to be bringing more information on archeological, uh, you know, what archeology span is, 
and how it's, you know, what, what it means to the Florida Keys, what the process is, which will be really interesting for, uh, to show our visitors and our guests. And um, so I'm really excited about that. Brad, you said the um, pre-European settlers, how far back are you talking? I, I guess the answer is it depends. Um, the site that I'm looking at, our newest radiocarbon dates push it back to about AD 600, AD 700. Oh, wow. So 1300 years old. There are some sites inconclusively that are thought to be a little bit older in the, in the Key Largo area, perhaps even as old as a couple thousand years, 2,500 years. Um, I think in the Keys, it's the, there's probably sites that are even older than that, but they're drowned by ever rising sea levels over the past three or 4,000 years. Um, but there's, in short, there's a, there's a really solid record of sites across the Florida Keys by about 8,500 to 750 is when you see a, a large proliferation of sites show up. Are the sites in Key Largo uh, open to visit or observe? No, they're not. Unfortunately, and me and Brad were talking about this earlier this morning, there's no publicly available or publicly interpreted prehistoric Native American site anywhere in the Florida Keys, which is a super sad state of affairs. Um, we hope to change that in the future, um, but right now that's sort of just a, a work in progress, and many of those that survived development and storms are located off the beaten path. Thank you. Ryan, about how many, how many prehistoric sites would you estimate to be in the Florida Keys? I know you've done some work on, on a, a few years ago but about discovering new sites or... Yeah, um, there's probably a, it depends on how you define a site, but I mean, there's, there's several hundred if, you are, if you're including sites that are as small as comprising a, a few like midden trash piles of shell refuse and things like that. Um, larger, more substantial sites that are still intact today on, you know, sites that are accessible from US-1 are few and far between. I, I imagine there's probably on the order of, you know, less than 20 and probably less than 10 of those are of any size. Ryan, we, we have one question. Um, asking where in Stock Island is the site you're investigating? The site is now gone um, entirely so far as we know, like so many others, unfortunately, but it was once located on the northwest corner of Stock Island where the county prison is today. So historically, that little area of land where the county jail is today was its own little island as recently as the 1850s, before it was connected by Phil. And so that's partially the reason that it was preserved from all the mainland development or, you know, quote unquote, mainland development that occurred on Key West and on the bigger part of Stock Island. That's why this site survived, because it was kind of offshore just a little bit on its own little area. Uh, Ryan, Daryl Daryl Duda is asking, which indigenous Caribbean Indian tribes made their way to the Keys? That's a good question. We were not entirely sure because we've never found super conclusive material evidence or Caribbean artifacts anywhere in the Keys. There's been reports of them over the years, but none of them have ever been confirmed by professional archaeologists or scientists or, or historians. Um, I think the most likely scenario, personally, is that the Lucayan Taino that lived in the Bahamas, when they were spreading northward from Hispaniola around AD 700, that 
I mean, they spread all the way up to Grand Bahama and, and islands in that area, which is, you know, much farther north than the Keys or even the southern mainland of Florida. So I think those groups probably would have landed somewhere in southeastern uh, Florida at some point and had informal contacts with the native Florida groups. But it's weird that the material evidence that we study as archaeologists the artifacts and things, we just don't find Caribbean artifacts in South Florida sites. Excellent. Uh, one of our viewers is Richard Warren. I know he, I, he has some questions about, thanks for joining us. He has some questions about uh, sites on Plantation Key. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Richard Warren. Um, I'm a, an undergraduate student at the Catholic University of America and I'm doing a little project on Founders Park. I'm an architecture student. Um, so, and I, I grew up in the Keys. I'm very familiar with the area. I'm in Executive Bay in, um, in Island Rada. But my questions pertain to Founders Park. That's what my project focuses around. It's on um, redeveloping Founders Park to create a more inclusive community-based environment um, and one of the ways I want to do that is include some of the history of the keys. Um, so my questions are really about like the burial mounds that are in the area and what happened to them, um, why were they leveled, and what happened to the remains and the artifacts, if there were any that were found in them. Sure. So first off, the earliest records that I'm aware of, like professionally recorded records that I'm aware of are from the early 1940s from a guy named John Goggin, who was the first professional and academic archaeologist to really make waves in the Keys um, in terms of indigenous or aboriginal archaeology. And he recorded five sites on Plantation Key and I th if, I, if memory serves, about three of those were mounds. One was rock and coral sand or, or the local limestone and coral sand. One of those was limestone and queen conch shells. And another was a plantation key number four was a massive dirt midden that you know was six feet tall, a couple hundred feet long. Um, and at the time that he was recording those sites, he was a student, a PhD student at Yale. And that's where a lot of his artifacts that he collected at that time ended up. And as far as I know, many of them are probably still there. Um, he didn't mention specifically any burials. That doesn't mean that they were or were not there, um, but he doesn't talk about them in his notes. I know, just to follow up real quickly, I've talked to a lot of, of um, Keys kids who grew up in the 60s and 70s um, who would venture, who would go out to these mounds, specifically the ones on Plantation Key, and they would go, you know, pick up shells and, and artifacts and kind of walk away with them. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those mounds over the years were kind of pilfered, you know, just by, 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 you know, by locals, just kind of, you know, going through them and picking, picking them up. And bringing them back to the house, which you know, of course, they're lost there from that point forward. And and how and I mean, a lot of the biggest middens across the Keys and Plantation Key is one of them. Uh, residences, you, you know, people's houses were constructed on top of them. They were bulldozed, and then a house was built, or they were bulldozed and a commercial building was constructed. <clears throat> So um, Richard specifically, if you want to talk more about it uh, for the project, we could like exchange emails later on and um, talk about that. Excellent. Um, ben Ruby has a question. Did they make their middens to create higher land for hurricanes or strictly uh, for refuse? Sure, it would have been both, definitely, because you're going to have a lot of trash when you're eating like shellfish and fish bones and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, on the one hand, it's convenient to pile it up, but it also would have served to put you at higher places above sea level. And we see that across coastal Florida on all the barrier islands. And, you know, 
the same would have been true of the keys. I think what's different in the keys and maybe was even an advantage is some of the keys, Key West, for example, Winley Key are over 15 feet above sea level at their highest points. And that would have been different from a lot of the barrier islands on the, both the Atlantic and the Gulf Coast of Florida. So in some places anyway, they were working with higher, you know, higher elevations above sea level and those mounds and things would have only helped really. So there's a big difference between like the Calusa mounds over, over like, like, like Mound, Mound Key in uh, Southwest Florida, where they're making these, these massive mounds and building structures on top of these mounds. Mm -hmm. I think so, we would have had a, a slightly different um, scenario in the Keys where that wasn't necessary to the same scale. And they also didn't have the ability to do so in the Keys because, I mean, in Calusa territory and farther north, 90% of the middens that we find are almost entirely oyster shell. And there's no, well, there's not, there's a subspecies of oyster in the Keys, but it's small, rare, and we don't find it often in middens. So they didn't have the same construction materials um, available. And they also, like I said, they didn't necessarily need to construct mounds of such scale as we see in the 10,000 islands and in other, excuse me, places in Southwest Florida. And also the populations were much smaller in the Keys, I believe. I, I, yes, they, been like in the Calusa Nation. Absolutely. So smaller islands and all of our 16th century, right when the Europeans arrived, um, the populations were smaller as well. And so it wouldn't have been, uh, Brad makes a good point, it wouldn't have been necessary to, or not necessary, it wouldn't have, um, they wouldn't have accumulated or needed to accumulate as much trash or construction materials as they did in other areas where they had, you know, thousands and thousands of more individuals. And that's one of the, Mary Jo, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Okay. Were the middens ever used as cemeteries as well? Or have you ever found any skeletal remains in any of the middens? Yeah, so, well, usually, I mean, in my personal experience and what I've read about, usually in the middens, um, we'll find an isolated human remain here and there. I'm not aware of, in the Keys, a complete burial or, or something like this, although it has, it does occur in other places and farther north in Florida, they've been found um, in middens. It occurs in other places in the world like Brazil, and it, it generates a lot of controversy among archeologists of, you know, trash and secular versus religious and like what these sort of shell piles uh, might mean. And so that's something that's an always present debate in people who work at like shell mounds and like shell sites. And what's interesting in the Keys is the sites, even the middens don't really look like massive shell piles um, because there's so much midden soil. And again, there's no oysters and clams and things, there are, but their numbers are so much smaller. So the sites in the Keys look, look different. And, um, but to answer your question, yeah, so they, they occur elsewhere. There's hints of maybe individuals being buried in some of the rock mounds that are found across the Keys or that once existed. And that's, a, that's another issue that we bump into though is a lot of these are confined to historical documents or to archaeologists that were talking about this a hundred years ago and now the now the sites are long gone and so we can't confirm. Um, Brad has a, not me, there's, there are two Brads <laughs> listed on here today. Brad, you have your, your hand raised up. Do you want to unmute yourself and, uh, and ask your question? All right, in the meantime, Brad, we'll get back to you when you, uh, you I can't see your face, but I see your hand raised. Um, in the meantime, uh, Ben Ruby is, is asking, yeah, the Calusa were the dominant political force in South Florida. Um, 
and the, and while their their range was generally southwest coastal Florida, uh, the question really is: um, were the, were they in the? How were the Calusa in the Keys? All right, so that's a good question and one that we don't have that archaeologists don't have a simple answer to yet, and it's something that we're working on. Um, the problem is the name Calusa and the Calusa group and everything arrives in the 16th century when the Spanish call them that. And when you go back hundreds or even thousands of years, then we have no idea what these groups called themselves. And so we have to rely on, you know, just the artifacts and, and what they look like. So, but what we suspect is that people who lived in Southwest Florida, you know, let's say AD 700 or so when the Stock Island site was settled, for example, um, people were coming down from the mainland. And some of those were probably Calusa or Calusa affiliated ancestrally because the pottery types that we find in the Keys and particularly at Stock Island and in some other places across the Keys, you know, resemble. They're all uh, resemble those pottery styles. There's no pottery type that we know of that occurs only in the Keys. Every single one of them, all of the known types occur elsewhere across South Florida. And so that speaks to some kind of relationship. Whatever that is, we could debate or have ideas about, but certainly all these folks are related. And I will say that the, with Stock Island in particular, the ceramic types resemble more so the 10,000 Islands area than they do something that's found on the Atlantic coast, for example. So that's maybe tentative support for an idea that people just came straight on south across Florida Bay, um, hit Vaca Key, Marathon area, and continued on down um, as one of their primary ways of, of travel to the area. Excellent. Brad, I see you are, uh, are you, you're unmuted. Do you want to ask your question? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, actually, you pretty much answered the question. If the Calusa didn't come from the Caribbean islands, I was going to ask where did they think they came from, but he just kind of answered that, so thank you. Right, and, and, and people have been living, had been living in South Florida for thousands and thousands of years before the Keys took on their present character. And so when sea levels were rising after the last ice age ended, um, people were already living in Florida um, along the coast and down the peninsula. And so when those landscapes were changing and the Keys were becoming islands as we know them today, people were probably exploring those, you know, islandscapes and waterscapes as they were changing. And so I think people would have known for a really long time what was different about the coral reefs and what was different about those habitats down in the Keys that um, were, were different from everything else, all the landscapes in, in South Florida. Excellent. All right. Do we have any, any questions out there or? Nope. Okay. Would I be able to ask a question? Yeah. Hi. Um, have you ever found that the middens have been used by two different uh, sources of people? That, this, that they reuse the same middens or are they just, everyone does their own thing in different areas? Yeah, um, that's a really, really good question. We have found that um, some we have these ceramic types, which basically become like our chronological sort of markers because they were produced for 100 or 200 years. And it's, it is interesting at some sites, you have all the ceramic types, all the markers that show up for 1000 years straight of ev evidencing, you know, continual occupation over that time span. And then other sites are weird that 
they have ceramic markers from let's say AD 1000 to AD 1200. And then all of a sudden there's a multi-century gap. And then the ceramic markers for a couple hundred years later or European markers show up. And so it is interesting. Some sites we see evidence where they were there for many, many centuries continually. And then at other sites, they founded them at some time period and then there's a big gap and then they reoccupy the site. And just as a, a carryover for that, also, you know, when the, the early settlers came to the islands, these middens over hundreds and hundreds of years would begin to produce, you know, fertile, fertile soil as they, de as they decomposed. And so because, uh, so, so when early settlers began to come to the islands, they would often find these middens and then take that fertile soil to create gardens that they could, that they could help plant, which is why some, many of the middens and many of these sites, you know, were looted or not looted, but, you know, uh, kind of uh, dismantled, you know, in, in the 1800s as well. So there are probably many more that were never found or never seen again. Right. Into the, into the early 20th centuries, as I'm told, midden soil was prized in the Keys and had a, had a going rate. <laughs> I often like, you know, kind of compare it to, because when you, as you're in the Keys, you know, there, there's so little, such, such little topsoil, but mm -hmm. you come upon these middens, these midden yep. areas, and there's this like, almost like coffee grounds. It, it, it's it's yep. very kind of rich, rich, nutrient rich soil that mm -hmm. would have been, you know, gobbled up by, you know, early pioneers who wanted to, you know, feed their families, you know, uh, greens and vet garden, you know, vegetables and fruits, as well as the ample supply of, of proteins coming out of the water and, and with deer and raccoons and turtles on land as well. Yeah, and it's, it's used as a marker to this day for archaeologists when we're looking at a landscape and trying to find a midden site that maybe we can't see readily on the surface or spotting one when you're in the middle of the woods or in the middle of a mangrove hammock or something and you're looking for a site, you look for a tree that doesn't belong or a tree that's the only one on the landscape. I was at Harbor Key in Tampa Bay a few days ago and there was a massive gumbo limbo tree that, you know, probably the only one on that little island and they're, they're markers of, of rich midden soil. We have a question from Jamie Akuka, I believe. Uh, did any group use any type of prehistoric scuba to allow them to stay underwater longer? I imagine for harvesting fish or, or conch or lobster. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. They, I've, I've never read anything about that. Um, I know from just studying and looking at island sort of cultures from across the globe that a lot of these societies are growing, you know, for many, many centuries growing up surrounded by the sea. They get skills um, in terms of being able to dive very deeply, hold their breath for an incredible length of time, get really, really good with a spear for, for turtles and for fish and these kinds of things. There are accounts by the Spaniards of just how skillful all the Native Americans were um, with regard to hunting. I mean, I, I think of things like um, in the South Pacific, there's quite a few groups that strap rocks to themselves and can walk around barefoot at the bottom uh, of adjacent to a coral reef and hold their breath for several minutes and stab, uh, you know, as many fish as they can get and then come up a couple minutes later. So I'm sure when they were taking canoes out to the reef that they were capable of things that your, your average person today would, would not be able to do. And kind of to, to, to carry that forward, when the Spanish arrived and, you know, and their ships were being wrecked, um, they would often have the Indians be become become their divers because they were mm -hmm. able to you know to swim yeah. and, and hold their breath longer. So they would they would have the Indians you know go out and, and help help salvage you know wrecked cargo off the off the reef and off the off these sunken ships. Definitely, as soon as that's a amazing point. Thanks, Brad. Like, yeah, as soon as as soon as the Europeans arrive and ship, shipwrecks start piling up on the reef they um 
all the accounts are all, oh, we took native divers from this town and, and so on. So it's, um, it was big industry and yeah, they were definitely taking advantage of their skill sets. And the Indians were really the, the first wreckers for down here. They were the first ones to spot these, these ships mm -hmm. and, and, and to go out into, a, they were very adept at, 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 at you know, very adept steaming to go out there and, and be able to, to take what they wanted to take. Now we have a question from, from Rick Sandella. I uh, hope I'm pronouncing these names, these last names, right? If human remains have not really been prevalent in middens, what are the prevailing theories on how these cultures dealt with human remains? So in the keys, there's a few different ones. I'd mentioned earlier, um, there's a possibility and probably there were human remains that were buried in limestone piles. There were a few in South Florida and in the Keys documented burial mounds of fine sand that were capped by clay or capped by pieces of limestone or whatever was available. Um, in the 16th century, there are Spanish accounts of folks being buried in chests along with whale tusks of right whales that they would seasonally hunt as they're migrating southward in the winter months. Um, we've never found anything like that, but there's certainly no reason to believe that the Spanish were making something like that up. So um, it, it's, it's thought that some of the islands off the main uh, contiguous line of the Keys, some of the more outlying islands could have been used as burial mounds and there have been um, human remains found where, you know, midden soil had been piled up and various things. So I, I think it's, when we're dealing with a thousand plus years of history, that burial practices would have changed over time and the Native Americans who ascribed to different cultures or religious groups or, or had different affinities would have changed practices over time. So I think that probably all the above that I've just mentioned were probably used at different times in different places. What about the idea of um, non-burial non uses or not, not, non, non, non-burial means of, of, of just putting the bodies out there as, as an offering to, you know, to the universe, um, as was practiced by a lot of Indian, you know, Indian peoples that, that you see. Um, thoughts on that? It's, it's certainly possible just in the southeastern U.S. Usually there's quite a bit of reverence for the human remains themselves and those sects of the southeastern um, cultures later on in prehistory that preserve the human remains in certain houses and, and get them out once a year and have a dance with grandma or grandpa, the elder, and, and to preserve the bones and to, to use them. And so that was more of like sort of the dominant idea was preservation for most of, for most cultures, but um, there's no accounting for, again, when you're talking about thousands of miles across the Southeastern US or, or more, and if you're talking about thousands of years of history and prehistory, um, it's certainly possible. Is there a book title that you could recommend for someone like me that want, that's a novice? I'd like to start learning more. Sure. Um, in 1994, Gerald Milanich published, what is it, pre-Columbian, let me look at my, Archaeology of Pre-Columbian Florida. That's sort of a primer to all of Florida Native American groups. And that, that takes you from the first Floridians that we're aware of all the way up into European contact. And now a lot of the info in that book has changed a little bit since 94, but it's a good, um, it's a good summary. Thank you. You're welcome. 
What about Goggins' book as it relates to upper metacombi in this area? Sure. If you're interested in the keys specifically, um, yeah, Goggins' book out of Yale Press. What is it? Excavations of upper metacombi. I know, I know all the citations by heart by their last <laughs> names in year, but I never know the titles of the books. Um, it's Yale Publications in, in Archaeology, and it's Goggin and Sommer, S-O-M-N-E-R, published in 1949. And that's on their work excavating at uh, a site on Upper Matacombe. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Now, is that the same site that's behind... Uh, on, on lower, uh, lower upper mat, kind of yes. on the back side. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is still there is still active archaeology going on in the Florida Keys. It's not a dead or lost, you know, art. There are still active, like 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 Ryan's working down in Stock Island. There are other sites that have not been lost to construction and progress. Um, and 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 the the site that Goggin studied and. Um, Dr. Tracy Ardron from University of Miami has, has done a lot of work on that side as well, which is a very large, described as almost the size of a football field. It's a very large site that is um, not open to the public, but one that is still an active, an, an active dig. Yeah, there's a few projects going on. Um, we're, I'm working with Tracy also on a site in Key Largo and there is a newer faculty member at the University of Florida, and she's also a partner on that same project in Key Largo, and she's looking to expand and begin more uh, new projects in the Keys. And she's an archeologist, um, Michelle Lefebvre is her name. She's a specialist in zooarchaeology, so looking at animal bones and faunal remains from, from archeological sites. And so in coming years, she'll be able to tell us a lot about um, the diets and what, what it was actually in proportions, sort of over time, what it was that people were consuming in the Florida Keys. That's kind of an interesting segue into the next question. Um, oh, all right. Has any viable genetic material been collected in the key, at the Keys sites? From humans? Uh, it's not specific, but humans or, or animal. I know on the shells, you've done work on, on dating uh, the fishing seasons, you know, Aboriginal fishing seasons using, using shells, which is, you know, it's shell-based calcium kind of thing, but. Um, genetic material. There are there may be some not archaeological that I'm aware of. There may be some biologists that have, of course, that have done genetic studies on certain animals, probably the key deer and some of the other prominent ones. Not on archaeological samples that I'm aware of. Nothing on humans. Um, and, and I don't think anything on, on animal reins. I'm racking my brain trying to think. Uh, we've done chemical studies, as Brad alluded to. That's what I'm working on, um, looking at some of the clam shells from Stock Island to determine the season of the of the year of any given year that they were collected. Um, so I do expect in the coming years, as methods get better and more people get involved in the Keys, that there could be genetic research on sea turtles, for example. There's a project farther north in Florida that um, was looking to see what species of sea turtles were being hunted most often by Native Americans, and they had some genetic success with that. And so I could see something like that coming down to the Keys in, in the coming years. All right. Ben Ruby has another question. Many indigenous people died off over generations as a result of the Spanish coming to Florida due to disease. Is that drop off in Indian populations reflected in the archaeological record? And you might also want to incorporate the idea of the, like the Seminole peoples coming down in the 1700s as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think it's definitely reflected in the archaeological record. 
um, because you can, the sites that were of massive scale, such as the Calusa in Southwest Florida that built the biggest um, shell terraforming islands and, and altering the landscape in a way that's, that's bigger than anywhere else in South Florida that we're aware of, Again, we can look back at the shell and bone tool types, the ceramic markers and things, and see and, and do radiocarbon dating over time and see sort of the zenith of a lot of these things um, in terms of like architecture that's present on the landscape. And so, yes, I think once Europeans arrive, it reorganizes where the Native Americans are living, what, what their mode of existence is, what their job is, who they're trading with, why they're trading with people. And um, I think our evidence in the Keys suggests that, you know, increasing populations probably over time up to the point the Europeans arrive, and then um, they're reduced very drastically. So, they record, the Spanish record in the, by the end of the 16th century, maybe the 1570s, that some 30,000 people lived in South Florida. That's a, an estimate by some Spaniards. Um, and that's reduced by the middle 18th century to a couple hundred people. Of, of those that were native to South Florida, Brad was talking about the Seminole who came down from Georgia, South Carolina, and were, um, were other Native American groups that came in the 19th century, uh, and perhaps a little bit earlier than that. But uh, in terms of the native population, you know, you're talking about 98% wipeout in 200 years. Um, Jennifer, Lindsley has a question. I heard there are midden piles at or around Bear Lake in Everglades National Park. Do you know the, the, the tribes that created those mounds? Yeah, the Bear Lake sites are really, really famous. Also excavated by that same guy, John Goggin, um, and later John Griffin. Um, they haven't been investigated in a very, very long time. They're no doubt the ceramic types that I've been talking about, they're definitely related to sites in the Keys. They're definitely related to sites in the 10,000 Islands. And so these were, these were the same groups that were probably inhabiting the Keys as, as those that were at Bear Lake. I, and that's one of the sites that I think is gonna be earmarked in the future for archeologists to return uh, to and do more work. Excellent. Hey, Ryan, this is Erin. Um, I have a question. It, this Something that really kind of surprised and upset my very novice idea of archaeology that I learned in one of your um, previous presentations is that um, you touched on this at the beginning that the Stock Island site, you said, doesn't exist. You know, it's it's now under our, our jail facility. So what what does active archaeology that you're doing on a site that now has something on top of that, what does that really look like and what kind of avenues do you have for, you know, future exploration or, or gaining knowledge in that area? Sure. So my research was made possible by Irving Eister and Robert Carr, who were former archaeologists that excavated at Stock Island and later donated their materials to the state of Florida. And so, and those were never studied or analyzed thoroughly. They were excavated and a brief report was written and then not much work was done. And they've been with the state in Tallahassee um, for a couple decades. And so my work was made possible by going back through its 35 boxes worth of material and getting radiocarbon dates on the charcoal and putting all of the artifacts and faunal and animal remains into chronological order and looking at how the site changed over time and what ceramic markers were present and doing that study that I alluded to with the clamshells to see what times of year 
the Stock Island site was, was deposited. And so my work was only made possible because a lot of that material was preserved. And so to answer the second part of what happens in the field now is it's possible. I, I sort of surveyed the area around the island, both in the water and right on the hammock's edge. And there doesn't appear to be much. Um, I think what a future study is going to look like is looking for deposits on mainland Key West. It might involve talking to private property owners in some of the older houses in Old Town and looking for affiliated sites. There might be some sites on the airfield at Boca Chica that have been preserved. There's certainly been many documented. And, um, and then it's gonna be indirect evidence of people um, coring into doing soil coring into the salt ponds in Key West and in other areas that might have into intact deposits, we'd be looking for thick charcoal that wouldn't probably have otherwise been there. Um, can be a marker of human activity. So it's, it's going to continue to be a lot of indirect ways of getting more information about Stock Island. Thanks, Aaron. Does anybody else have any? Um, all right, so we have, Ryan, why don't you, can you talk about some of the things that you've, um, some of the artifacts that you have uncovered that are of note? The what? That, so, some of the artifacts of note that you, some of the more interesting things that have surprised you or that have, uh, that have that, that, that you uncovered and said, wow? Sure, sure. Um, gosh, I think one of, some of the coolest things have honestly been, and I'm, I'm more of a, a prehistoric guy, um, or at least I used to be. Once Europeans got here, I'm like, oh, well, they muck things up. And, um, but I will say it's been really, really cool at Stock Island to see particularly the 16th century artifacts, the Spanish uh, Majolica ceramics, the Spanish olive jar. And then um, there was, at the end of the 17th century, probably earlier as well, there was a trade between Southwest Florida and Havana, Cuba. And one of the items that shows up in the historical documents that they were trading quite a bit was amber. And um, I have, both a lot of fragments of amber from Stock Island and completed items such as like amber beads. And so that was really, really cool for me to see as, as an archeologist of something written in the historical record and then in a place like Key West showing up that's a natural waypoint between South Florida and between Havana uh, showing up. And that's, it's really, really cool when the historical record is supported by the archaeological record because sometimes you know that's the opposite turns out to be true. We have another question um, because of the uh, of the nature of, the, of these islands the Indians were often referred to as shell Indians. Could you talk about some of the tools that you have uncovered or some of the tools that were used by the Aboriginal people of the Florida Keys? Sure. Um, and I would, I think the term shell Indians sort of came about maybe as early as Cushing in the late um, 19th century, but because, and people called them the shellfish eaters because that's what preserved most. That was what was everywhere on the Florida landscape was, were these monumental 20, 30, 40 feet tall piles of oyster shell and things like that. So it was easy to to call them that, but I think it's most appropriate to maybe say that in the Florida Keys because in the Florida Keys, you're the farthest from natural sources of stone, which is what Native Americans elsewhere in Florida and certainly elsewhere in the Southeast US were using stone to make all, almost all of their tools, their spear points, their knives, their cutting implements, all, all this kind of stuff. And in the Keys, there's a noticeable lack of stone. And so all of their shell tools, or pardon me, all of their tools 
um, not all, many, were made out of shell. The big three were Queen Conch, the Florida Horse Conch, and the Lightning Whelk. Those are the three tools that show up most frequently at sites in the Florida Keys and at, certainly at Stock Island. And so you have Queen Conch axes, you have Lightning Whelk axes and hammers. Um, they're strong, they're durable. You can fell small trees with them. And so they're- Make a dugout canoe, for instance. They're what? Make a dugout canoe, for instance. You can make a dugout canoe. You can hollow the aperture, the opening of the shell. You can make that razor sharp and almost use it as a scraping tool for a canoe. And so to, to the person who asked that question, to your point, yeah, that's absolutely true in the keys that um, the, the larger gastropod shells would have been crucial, crucial resources. This is an example of an ads. This is a part of the lip of a queen conch, correct? Probably a queen conch. I can't yeah. see it very well. It's very <laughs> tiny. Yeah, this is um, a, a scraping tool. This was him. Jim Klepper was a local um, amateur archaeologist, historian, loved working with tools and loved the Indians. And this is um, Lignum Vadi, which is, which is, the, uh, which is the, uh, the stock. But then um, it, it, it's an example of how this would be a scraping tool, kind of an example. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so at the sites, we don't find the wood because it's long since decayed, but we'll find the finished shell tool product. And oftentimes the holes that were cut into the shell or something like that, that um, tells us what it was used for. Because shells are super strong. It's, you don't mm -hmm. think of shells as being strong, but there's a, we were talking about the Bailey's Matthews Museum on, on, on mm -hmm. Sanibel earlier today. And they have this, um, exhibit showing how hard it is to crush a shell and and the, and the kind of the kind of pressure it, it takes to to break a, a conch or a, or, or a horse conch or a whelk. And actually um, now that you showed that I can um, you want me to show a, I've got some big Florida horse conchs right behind me. Grab it. They're not tools but they show the size of what these things can get to. Um, So, I mean, wow. So something like this, um, I mean, it's just absolutely massive. This is, I don't know, it's over, a little over two feet long. It barely fits in the camera. But something like this could have been used as, as a pounding tool um, quite easily and would have been durable for a very, very long time. And also the, also the Florida State Shell. Also the Florida State Shop, yep. <laughs> it being Florida Independent or, or Florida Statehood Day. Yeah, and it's the, it's the second biggest marine snail in the world. Only Australia has one that's bigger. Wow. Hey, here's a question. Have you found any dinosaur bones in the Keys? Or have you ever heard of any dinosaur bones being found in the Keys? I have not, and I also, I don't think I've heard of any. I've heard of some mammoth and megafauna and things like that found near Miami and some really old uh, sinkholes, but not dinosaurs specifically now. All right. Well, we're, we're, we're going to wrap up here pretty quickly. Uh, we have a few more minutes. If anybody has uh, another question to ask, this would be a great time to squeeze it in. I know uh, in our meeting earlier today with uh, with Brian and then Sarah Ares Rigsby from um, uh, FPAN, which is the Florida Public Florida Archaeology Network. <laughs> Public <laughs> Network. We'll be bringing some of these artifacts that um, from Stock Island and other parts of the Keys into an expanded exhibit here at the Florida Keys History and Discovery Center in the months to come. So we're excited hey, about just that. And just say, I have a question. Just say yes. Who's talking and please talk. uh, I have a question. Yes. This Bob, this Bob Phil Ramo, I have a question. Please. Uh, yeah, uh, we live on Lake San Pedro on Plantation Key. And uh, I was wondering if anything's been done around the lake, well, the wet, you know, the wetlands around the uh, lake. Have any dug, dig, digs gone on there? 
I'm not aware of any specific digs that have been done lately. Um, the last sweeping sort of survey in the Keys that I'm aware of was in 2019 by Bob Carr's company, the His Archaeological Historical Conservancy, and they visited some sites um, on Plantation Key, but I don't recall off the top of my head if they did anything, I'm sorry, um, in that specific area of the lake. Okay, thank you. They usually deal in things that are at risk of development or are on um, incorporated property or unincorporated property. Um, so a lot of times things with like research goals don't happen nearly as often as the things that are in, uh, in trouble of being developed. Mary Jo's Kisco, that's a horse conk. Like that's it, yes. Yep. <laughs> that's a good size one too. <laughs> Holy cow. If that was a question, I'm sorry we didn't quite hear it. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, also, one final question. Uh, any digs that you know about uh, by Crocodile Lake? I know there are some Indian mounds that's up in uh, North Key Largo. Um, yeah, there um the research that i mentioned er earlier as far as i know there it's now been well over a year amid COVID and things but i think in the future there's going to be some continuing research in the northern key largo area on the usf uh, or usf uh the u s fish and wildlife <clears throat> that's a area. national that's a national property with the yes uh, and the so, off, off limit to the public without, um, you know, clearance or um, in, invitation only probably when research is happening out there. You are a right. tonight. Helena, do you want to, what's your question? Want to unmute yourself? There you go. The early Americans, Native American historic aboriginal are they terms that are reflect the yeah, here. can you hear brad i can't um, hear uh, she's asking I, I i think helena we're having a hard time hearing you okay i'm not sure why <laughs> no that sounds better just, yeah, right. just lean forward okay oh, there you uh, go don't say no here is there um, a preference on your part as an archaeologist to have us refer to these um, peoples of, of the Keys as Aboriginal, uh, Native American? Um, I don't know. Um, Just I want to be appropriate in, in what we're talking about and who we're talking about. Right. Um, as, as the archaeologist, we defer to the Native American populations themselves. Personally, I like Native American, um, and, but in terms of when I talk about them in professional publications and in research and things like that, um, we, we will defer to the Seminole or defer to the most closely affiliated native groups on what they would prefer to be called because I'm a white European guy studying uh, these, uh, the ancestors of, of these people. And so I always, I always defer to them. All right. Brad, do you have a question again? I see the hand, I'm not sure if that's a continuation. Yes. Okay. Yes, I do. Um, uh, with uh, Key West being called Bone Island, was there ever any uh, definitive answer of was it human bones, a battlefield, animal bones, etc.? Yes, I've certainly heard the stories, and there is 
there's a lot of historical evidence. There's a lot of early Euro-American and American settlers that come down in the 1820s and do surveys and talk about massive piles of conch shells and limestone rocks, human remains, um, bones scattered across the island or, or in different places, maybe even stone burial mounds that contain human remains. The, the problem is that it's only, it's confined to the historical record and today, as we know, all of us that have walked around Old Town, Key West, um, it's, it's all gone. And so, or at least it's, it's all built over. And so um, the potential to discover those kinds of things in the future is not impossible, but probably pretty limited. Um, and I think that, and it's unfortunate because I think that the, the largest site um, in that area would have been located on Old Town Key West because it's the highest elevation and all of the historical records talk about these big conch and limestone shell mounds that once existed there, but they say right after, you know, we bulldozed it and built something. So, um, so yeah, I think there's absolutely something to that name, um, whether that's specifically why it was called Bone Island, some people debate, but it's absolutely true that there were large uh, mounds on Key West at one time. All right, well, it's uh, a little after seven o'clock. I think we're gonna wrap up uh, our discussion for the night. Ryan, that was amazing. Thank you so much for, again, Thank coming you. back to participate with us here at the Discovery Center. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. And we will be doing this again, uh, I think, the next one, the next Career <laughs> Corner is in two months. Next, so, and next, uh, next month for the, for the uh, Curator's Corner, I will be talking about uh, Lower Matacumbi Key with a bunch of old pictures and some old stories about, about the island. Jill, do you want to sign us our off? Our full or? schedule of programming and lectures is on our website, Keys discovery.com and you'll you can find our schedule there thanks for being with us tonight we appreciate it and hope you uh learned something i know i did thanks to ryan and to brad very much it was very enjoyable thank you everybody thank you all so much. good night everyone